Hello, this is English 101 Composition, and I'm Michael Umphrey. I'll be your instructor for this class. Uh, I was just asked to do this job a couple of days ago, so I'm kind of scrambling to get things ready. Uh, and as I get things ready, I'll get them on the Schoolology website so that you um, will know what the expectations are when the assignments are due and that sort of thing. I think assignments for the most part will be due by midnight on Wednesday. I know a lot of people are using Sunday, but that kind of guarantees you're going to be preoccupied on the weekend. I would rather uh, have that done in the middle of the week. Um, so kind of count on that, having something that you need to turn into me every Wednesday or turn into the website, uh, Schoolology, every Wednesday. Um, the first assignment in this class is to write a personal narrative. And I don't, I'm not going to get very much into that. I'm not going to actually make the formal assignment yet. But I, I want to start by uh, inviting you to think a little bit more about what a narrative is. And in particular, uh, the difference maybe between a narrative and a story. Uh, let me get a screen up here if I have it. I have it, but I'm not at the beginning of it. Hmm. I'm using a uh, laptop I've never used before, so I'm being a little bit clunky. There he is. So narrative is one of the four modes of writing. Uh, the others are exposition, which mostly explains and analyzes, and then persuasion, which is an argument, uh, taking a particular point of view, trying to get the reader to adopt a particular point of view. Description, uh, which is, I think, obvious. It's uh, telling the reader how things appear to the senses. And then narrative. Narrative. A narrative relates a series of events. It's a narrative occurs in time. Uh, things are happening one after the other, and just just retelling those is basically a narrative. Um, the thing to keep in mind that's a little bit, I think, um, tricky is that all stories are narrative, but not all narratives are stories. Uh, Cognitive scientists have learned that uh, little babies, infants, um, by two years old can tell the difference between a story and a narrative that isn't really a story. Well, how can that be? Um, what is it that the children are recognizing? Um, the short answer is form. Narratives can ramble on and on more or less forever. But stories have beginnings, middles, and ends. They have form. Um, I worked with a woman once who, uh, she had a marvelous talent for narration. I mean, she picked up so many details around her all the time and remembered them. Uh, it was kind of amazing. Uh, but she didn't have really a, a, a knack for story, so she'd, she'd start with something like, uh, on my way to work this morning, I saw a St. Bernard dog standing on the roof of a car. And so you lean forward a little bit, waiting for her to get to the point, what, what happens, what happens? And she would go on, it was so warm this morning, the sky was cloudy, so I thought it would be a little chilly when I went out. I put on a jacket, but when I got out there, it really, it, it was quite warm. And then she'd move on to mention how many potholes there were on the road. Um, she noticed that there was a new red car in the Wilson's driveway, and she was wondering whether or not they'd bought a new car. Uh, then some bit of political intrigue popped into her head, something she heard on the radio on the way to work, and uh, then how long the line was when she got to the coffee hut where she liked to get her morning espresso. Um, and it would just kind of go on like that. Um, and what you realize, uh, we've, all, we've all got caught in conversations with people like that. Uh, and at some point we realize that it's all narration, that there is no form, there's no point, which means there's no ending. 
it would never, ever, ever come to an end. And a common reaction to uh, becoming the target of that kind of endless narration is, is we start planning an escape. At the beginning, a narrative may sound like a story, but a story has a point. It's going somewhere. Um, and uh, the ending is the most obvious uh, part of the form. I mean, when a story ends, you know that it ends. You get it. It goes click, like the punchline of a joke. And that's, that's what even small infants are doing. They're figuring out that... Uh, there's a shape and a meaning to this and you learned what that is what makes a story well it's plot um, and uh, plot uh, I, I want you to think about plot when you're planning your story just the way your English teacher in middle school seventh grade probably taught it to you um, you in a plot you have a setting you have some characters and then this is the important part you have a conflict it's the conflict that drives the plot. You have a series of complications as a character tries to resolve the conflict, and generally it's one dang thing after another. Everything you try makes the situation worse. Like in a Hollywood movie, you'll go through four or five of these plot twists where it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it leads up to the climax, the point of no return. Uh, uh, nothing, the world, after the climax, the world will never be able to go back to the way it was. Uh, it's the turning point, and uh, the key action happens. The world has changed. And then there's the falling action, and all that's going on in the falling action is the writers uh, cleaning up loose ends, kind of letting you know what the world is like, the new world, now, after this story happened. Uh, it, uh, and it's the resolution. You need to see the character in a Hollywood movie. You need to see the character at least for a few moments in the new world after that climax. Um, you know, that's it. Uh, and I, I mentioned jokes, and I think jokes are, are a good example because they're, they many of them are stories. They take story from... They have a point and they have an ending. The ending is the punchline. When, when you hear the punchline, you instantly know the story is over. Uh, that's the form. That's what it's not narration. Um, lately, I've been doing kind of a deep dive on a project I'm working on into the history of communism, and I, I keep coming across uh, Russian jokes and Stalin jokes. Uh, so they go like this. A factory worker in the United States shows his house to a Russian colleague. Here's my room. This one's my wife's. This is my oldest daughter's. That's our dining room. Uh, then the guest room, etc. It goes on. Uh, the Russian guest, guest uh, looks all this and nods, pauses, and says, Well, it's basically similar to mine. Only we don't have the internal walls. Okay, you know, um, at that, you, you know immediately uh, the story's over. You, as we say, you get it. Um, others, uh, Stalin was visiting a small town in Russia. There was a huge crowd there to receive him, holding signs with words of praise for Stalin, the party, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and But one of the guys, an old guy, uh, that the secret police officer spotted was holding up a sign that said, Thank you, Comrade Stalin, for a happy childhood. And the officers were suspecting something, and so they approached the guy. They, they accosted him. What is this, some kind of mockery? You must be at least 80 years old. Comrade Stalin wasn't even born when you were a child. Old man, that's exactly what I'm thankful for. Um, so Stalin appears to Putin in a dream. He says to Putin, I have two bits of advice for you. Number one, kill off all your opponents. And second point, paint the Kremlin blue. Putin says, why blue? And Stalin, I knew you wouldn't object to number one. Um, even Stalin might tell a joke. Uh, one day he gathered his faithful people in the Red Square and proclaimed that he was now tell a glorious joke. 
His people were curious. Uh, well, Comrade Stalin, what is it? And Stalin stands up at the podium with a straight face and he uh, <clears throat> clears his throat and he says, Food. Everyone was puzzled. Comrade Stalin, we don't get it. Stalin smiled. Exactly. Um, well, I'd tell you a coronavirus joke now, but you'll have to wait two weeks to find out if you got it. Or uh, what's the difference between COVID-19 and Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet? One's a coronavirus, the other is a Verona crisis. Okay. Uh, what I do want you to keep in mind about jokes is really something to think about. They have a point and everything in them leads to the point and everything is a setup for the ending. I mean, that's kind of the basis of story, something for you to think about when you're thinking about your personal narrative. And probably the focus of the assignment will be uh, to tell us about a decision that you've made. Uh, obviously, the decision comes at the end, but the setup, what's at stake? I mean, what, I mean, I can do A or B. What's the cost of doing one or the other? If there really isn't a cost, the decision isn't hard. Uh, a hard decision is one where there, you have to make a real choice between very different outcomes. Um, and, and we can use jokes a little bit more to think about literature in general. They are a form of literature. Um, why do we tell jokes, like, especially about things that aren't funny, like communism or Stalin or coronavirus? Uh, well, one reason is that the joke creates a little community of people who hear it and laugh together. Uh, it's a sense of, we know we're not alone. Uh, a lot of art does that. Uh, art uh, exists best by creating a community, an audience. Um, the the art creates the audience and it gives us hope i mean we're suddenly we're with people that we're sharing at least something with um, um and that community that community of the audience of the joke is probably a better place to be than some place where people are taking stalin all seriously um another reason um is that stories we laugh at give us uh, some control. If we can laugh at a situation, it puts us above it and outside of it. And at least for a moment, uh, we're not completely controlled by it. Uh, it. The response may not be laughter. We can turn uh, a situation into any form of art uh, and that will allow us to, it will demonstrate that we have some control, at least of our emotions. We may not be able to control what's happening, but neither are we overwhelmed and destroyed by it. Um, making art in the face of difficulty is a kind of a rebellion. It's a refusal to be crushed by the things that do happen to us. One of the reasons that skilled writers can talk about topics, you know those topics you hear someone talking about it and it, it just makes you cringe a little bit? It's kind of maudlin and melodramatic. It, uh, it, it you know, it's, it's like an awkward moment. Like, why are you telling me this? Uh, writers can often, strong writers can often get away with sailing right into those sorts of things and we don't get that cringy, awkward feeling. And it's something that we, by controlling the material to give it a form, a style, the ar artist is demonstrating that he's just not uh, overwhelmed and lost in the, uh, in the situation. It's very human to make jokes in the face of tragedy. Uh, and not just jokes, but other kinds of art too. Um, here's a poem. Um, that you've probably read it before. I mean, if you, uh, some some English teacher at some point pulled it out, but it's it's a sonnet by John Keats. And when I say it's a sonnet, well, you know, it's fourteen lines, and you know, it's got a rhyme scheme. In this case, it's uh, B rhymes with garretry, brain rhymes with grain, so it's an A B A B rhyme scheme. Uh, you know, it's it's probably written in iambic pentameter, so uh, every every line has ten syllables, and they come in a particular pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables. 
So the first line, if I look at it, when I have fears that I may cease to be, yep, perfect dynamic pentameter, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, I mean that pattern of the syllables going through it. So, um, so there's, there's a lot going on in a sonnet. It's a complicated little art form. This one was written in 1818, um, and Keats was only 23 years old. But since at least 1816, a couple of years before, he had feared that he was going to die early. Uh, he had, both of his parents did. Um, that may be part of it. And it, it, it did happen. He got tuberculosis, and he, he didn't live to be uh, very old in his 20s. Um, and the poem is kind of about that feeling of facing that dream of that sense of impending doom. And yeah, the two things, um, I mean, Keats knows or believes that he has the most significant literary talent of any writer since Shakespeare. He can feel it. He really gets creating literature, especially poetry. And the other thing, he's, he's in love with um, a, a young woman named Fanny Braun. And he loves her passionately, but if he's dying, he can't possibly marry her. So, so let's look at the poem. When I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books in character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain. Uh, well, you've, you've got quite a lot going on there. Um, he's using some archaic words. Uh, Gleaned is, is a term for uh, g moving through the fields and gathering the grain from the stalks. Character is an old-fashioned word for uh, letters or words or books. Um, and then he, he keeps the image of the grain going. Uh, garners is an archaic word for granary, a place where you store the grain. So he's, he's intentionally creating kind of a poetic and a romantic um, sense of things. And then he goes on, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. Um, boy, he looks at the he looks at the stars, and he, he's so much in love, and he's not going to be able to uh, consummate that love. Uh, if you if you remember from studying sonnet somewhere before, they another part of the form that they have, very highly formed poem, is the first eight lines um, set up some kind of a, a conflict or a problem, and then the last six lines um, resolve it. And so um, that was the first eight lines. Sonnets typically, there's a turn of con some kind of a rhetorical turn after the eighth line. And here you get, he goes, and when I feel fair creature of an hour. So beginning with this line, he he's no longer talking um, sort of abstractly to uh, uh, an audience of potentially everybody, but he's addressing a particular person, a fair creature, a young woman. And when I fear, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wild wor of the wide world I stand alone and think till love and fame to nothingness do sink. And so it ends with a heroic couplet that is uh, two lines of iambic pentameter that rhyme, think and sink. Uh, so he does this elaborately um, structured verbal performance. Five stressed syllables for line, a fixed rhyme scheme, uh, setting up a problem at eight lines, solving it in six more, or resolving it. Um, and what I'd like to point out is the conflict. You know, a very deep conflict between what the poet is saying. Uh, I am so full of despair that love and fame don't mean anything. Uh, absolute uh, abandonment. of the, He has no hope for anything. Uh, he's saying that. But he's saying it in a highly elaborately organized poem. 
Kate's, Keith wrote the poem, we know, uh, between January 22nd and January 31st in 1818, uh, a little over a week there. We don't really know how many hours a day he worked on it, but uh, this is a difficult thing to do. I mean, to create a sonnet um, this well, everything's perfect. There's no lines, no, you know, you never find a word that makes no sense, but it's in there because it rhymes. It's, it's elegant. It's just really well done. Um, and so my question is, why? Um, why would he work so hard at writing this poem? I mean, he says he's he's given up on everything. And if you think it, about it for a while, I think I, I think part of what you get is part of the reason just had to be the pure joy of it. Uh, I mean, it's just fun to be able to do complicated performances. I mean. It, like if you're really good at soccer, it's just fun to make some moves out there that kind of dazzle everybody. If you're gifted with language as Keats is, uh, there's a deep joy in, I, you know, I, I, my argument would be that the poem says he's full of despair, but the existence of the poem kind of testifies to some sense of joy that he still had. Okay, um, now that I've kind of done the English teacher thing and beat it to death, uh, let's... Uh, second, this may not work. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, just let you listen to the poem performed straight through without commentary by um, a good actor. So let's, let's have a listen. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books in character <coughs> hope like rich garners the full ripened grain. When I behold upon the night starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love. Then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think to love and fame to nothingness do sink. Okay, that's that's about as far as I'm going to go um, today. I, I, uh, I'm not really through talking about story or narrative at all, but I have a feeling some of you may be feeling like you're about through. Um, I'll come back and deal with this more. I just wanted to uh, let you get a sense of who I am and what uh, what the course is going to be like. Uh, I will I will keep updating things as I get them finished on Schoolology. So keep checking in on that, and I'll pick up this theme soon and and go further with. Uh, uh, there's a lot more to story. It's an interesting interesting topic, and you all like stories. You love stories. Uh, I, I'll probably talk a little bit about um, Hollywood movies because um, Hollywood, I found Hollywood uh, screenwriters tend to be more, tend to be smarter in the way they talk about story than like English professors are. And I think it's because they keep putting stories out there and testing them and they test them with uh, dollars. How many ticket sales are there? Uh, what really does work when it comes to story? Hollywood has learned a huge amount. I mean, in order to do some um, uh, blockbuster films, what, what you really need to do is to understand human nature. I mean, what is it that people go to stories for? Uh, what works? And they know. So um, that's it for today. Uh, check back and I'm look, looking forward to meeting you all.